One of the underlying uh, pieces of this story is how much is still secret, uh, how many things are still uh, sealed, how many things are, are redacted, how much information, even involving his death, there is so much we don't know. And as long as we don't have these kinds of information, we're going, there's always going to be conspiracy theories, number one. And number two, I mean, it's way really to keep people silent. Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Post Live. I'm Carol Lennig. I'm a reporter here on the National Desk and I couldn't be more thrilled professionally and personally to tell you that we're going to have Julie K. Brown, uh, an amazing investigative reporter from the Miami Herald, a standout in her generation in this field. And I say that with a little bit of you know, competitiveness and also excitement and envy. Um, she's uh, Julie, welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you. I'm honored to be here, especially to ha have you here. Um, you know, hosting this, I appreciate it. I'm I'm delighted, and you're the author of a new book, Perversion of Justice, and we are going to jump into that like instantaneously because. Um, I know how hard it was to break this story open, break it wide, how many reporters had ignored it. Um, you didn't. And I know how hard it is to write a book. <laughs> so I, how many, I feel like you've written about 40 in the past year. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Well, um, this one seems like it would be very difficult to get to the bottom of and then to and it's really a reader service, a public service, what you've done. Um, I would love to get right to some questions if you don't mind. And I think one of the things so many people in the American public really yearn to know is how'd you do it? Like and journalists want to know, and they make up a lot of the American public, journalists want to know what was the breakthrough? So let's, let's start there if you don't mind, like, what was the breakthrough that got you closer to this story and seeing what Jeffrey Epstein might be up to and what the prosecutors who had given him such a sweet deal um, may have given away? Well, there's no question that the breakthrough was my interview with the victims and specifically the very first uh, woman that spoke to me and confided in uh, Emily and I. Emily is my um, visual journalist, uh, photographer, videographer who did this project with me. And it was very hard to convince. We, we really didn't get um, many women who were willing to cooperate with us, but um, Michelle Licata was the first one. She lived outside of Tennessee. The t uh, by this time, she, you know, she had, this happened to her when she lived in Palm Beach. She was very young. Um, I think she was 14 years old and um you know she had never really spoken about this to anyone um like this before she she was very reticent as you can imagine her own lawyer told her not to do the interview so we went to tennessee thinking well she might do it or she might not do it and once she started talking it just spilled out of her and we were pretty dumbfounded at the story she told us, it was very, um, it was very hard to us, quite frankly, to, 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 to not sympathize. I mean, she was crying. It was, um, it was the first time she really had, she talked about how she felt about prosecutors and what they had done. You know, in her mind, no one had really asked her about this part of the story before. 
So when we finished that interview, we were driving back to the airport. Emily and I were just, you know, in a stunned silence because the story that she told us was um, just incredibly traumatic and moving. And Julie, did you did you feel like there was some special reason that she agreed to talk? You know, I spend my life trying to persuade people who don't want to talk to do it. And on this subject, you know, being sexually assaulted, being molested serially, you know, these are things people have a hard time telling their therapists. What do you think was the reason she eventually gave you this insight and, and trusted you? Well, you know, first of all, I did some homework ahead of time before I interviewed these these women because I I was keenly aware that this was going to be a very traumatic, um, you know, conversation, and I didn't want to re-traumatize them. So I did do some homework. I spoke to some experts about this, and and then I also realized that I I didn't need to hear the salacious details of the uh, rape. I didn't need to hear that part of the story. She was clearly listed in the court documents as one of his victims. Uh, so she didn't have to really go over that. And I told each victim, look, if you don't want to tell me what he did to you, you don't have to, because I'm really interested in the in the in how the prosecutors handled this. I mean, how the FBI questioned you, uh, how you found out about what, what Epstein's deal was. Where were you when you found out? How did your parents uh, handle the news? I mean, these were topics that were didn't delve directly into their trauma. So I think that that was um, a relief to a lot of them. Now, some of them did share some of the uh, uh, details of the, the sexual abuse they suffered. But, you know, I think the fact that I wasn't pressuring them to do that helped give them a little bit more um, confidence or a little bit more um, trust in what Emily and I were doing. What did you find shocking, not about the sexual crimes, but what did you find shocking that the victims didn't know or or what what they told you that was a, just a total surprise to you? Just how much they were kept in the dark about exactly what happened and how the deal went down. And, and you know, and then with my reporting, corroborating, not only corroborating that, but also showing that there was, that was by design. I mean, the communications that were, uh, you know, flying back and forth between Epstein's defense attorneys and the prosecutors it showed that there was, a, you know, a, definitely a, a concerted effort to keep this story to keep this crime uh to contain it really and to not let um the victims the victims lawyers their families the, the, even the media not really uh know the scope of this crime or the fact that they were negotiating this kind of a deal and you know i have got to say again in the competitive and and uh and jealous spirit um I remember when there was news flashing about Epstein and Clinton, and I was assigned for a short period of time to sort of get to the bottom of those crazy flights that they were on together, search the manifest, etc. And you know, then another enormous scandal story came along that I was um, jumping on, and and it took me in another direction. But what do you think was the reason that other media? You know, this involved the president of the of the United States at one point, a former president. This involved a member of the royal family that were connected to Jeff Epstein. What do you think was the reason? And I'm looking with some uh, self judgment here. So many news organizations didn't do what you did. Well, I didn't. You know, I thought. You know, I deliberately didn't read everything that had in fact i've read very little about what had been written about this case um when i took this up because i wanted to look you know i wanted to look at it like a cold case detective i wanted to take out the files and just look at it myself and sort of take it apart and put it back together so the fact that I, of course everybody knew clinton was on the plane i mean trump was on his plane too uh you know all the salacious 
Lolita Express pedophile island stuff, I put aside. And I wanted to look at it from the day that, you know, the, the police got the call, you know, that this girl was molested all the way through step by step. And if the Clinton thing came up, then it came up or if one of those other angles, but I didn't go at it from the Clinton angle. I went at it from the very beginning. So I, I just took a different approach. I sort of, um, you know, I just took it apart and, and tried to put it back together because keep in mind by this time, a lot of, you know, a decade had gone by. So there was new information. And in my mind, I thought, well, there might be some people who didn't want to talk back then who, uh, you know, people get a conscience all of a sudden and they want to talk about it or they have the police chief, for example, the lead detective, they had never spoken on the record before in part because they kept thinking uh, that he would be eventually be prosecuted and that they didn't want to, um, you know, they didn't want to be accused of tainting their their uh, their testimony if they had to go into court. But by this time, they had sort of felt like, look, nothing else has worked. So I might we might as well uh, finally talk about it. And, you know, I'm starting this unfairly for some viewers who maybe didn't follow it as closely. So let me let me remind everybody that, you know, there were a series of crimes um, in, and sexual trafficking charges that were investigated involving one of the richest men in America, Jeffrey Epstein, a uh, person with homes in New York and uh, in the Caribbean and other places. And he um, essentially was able to negotiate an agreement in um, 2017 that allowed him to avoid really the kind of, of prosecution any sex trafficker would face, he was able to be in, imprisoned for a short period of time uh, in a very minimum security prison where he could come and go um, and with a television and other things to entertain him as part of this deal made by then prosecutor Alex Acosta in, in Florida, a federal U.S. attorney. Um, None of this information was shared with the victims and never really made news at the time. And Julie K. Brown went back and excavated that deal and who who was harmed. Um, what did you learn, Julie, about the prosecutors who, you know, from my experience, want to go hard on a sex trafficker, who want to really come down on that kind of person. What did you learn about the inner workings of that team when Acosta ultimately made the final decision to sign and ink a, a really sweet and generous deal for Epstein? Well, let's look at it this way. If this had been any other person, um, you know, Joe Smith, who had committed a crime like this, we wouldn't even be talking about it because he would still probably be in prison. It, it was very clear that for these prosecutors, before they knew who Jeffrey Epstein was, they were gung-ho about going after this case. It was only after they found out who he was and that Epstein hired all these, um, you know, high-powered lawyers. And he did, uh, he, he, he had a method where he hired these lawyers who all had connections to the prosecutors. They were like a boys club, practically, of, of a dream team with, you know, Kenneth Starr and Alan Dershowitz, Jay Lefkowitz, Roy Black. I mean, these were the one woman he had on his team, uh, Lillian Sanchez, had dated the head of the criminal division for the U.S. Attorney's Office in West Palm Beach. So he did this by design. He hired lawyers that he knew had connections to all the prosecutors. So these these lawyers were able to call up these prosecutors and say, you know, hey, they're, um, you know, and, and, you know, a normal defendant doesn't have that luxury where his lawyer can just call up the head of the criminal division and say, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and talk about this. I mean, that's pretty much what every well-heeled defendant does, you know, find the local counsel that's really got the in who practiced or, or clerked for the judge who might uh, oversee the sentencing. I mean, Epstein got a whole nother level of treatment. Were there not any prosecutors on this team who were aghast and upset? 
Well, the female, the, the lead prosecutor on the federal, um, it, that was part of the federal case, Anne Marie Villa Fauna, was not in that, that, but she was not part of the boys' club either. So, you know, much to her, um, you know, dismay, they basically went over her head. The, the defense attorneys would just call her bosses and they would meet with her bosses and they tried to really shove her aside. And she stood her ground uh, for a very long time trying to get this case to move forward and to, you know, for one thing, she was trying to get his computers. His computers had never been seized that she believed they contained an awful lot of evidence to corroborate what the uh, victims had told them. Uh, that never happened because her bosses uh, didn't approve the subpoenas um, to get the uh, to get the computers, for example. I mean, there were just countless roadblocks that were thrown in her direction. You know, when I think about your amazing relentlessness in this work, Julie. I think about something Bob Woodward um, every now and again would say when he was in the newsroom uh, more regularly than he is now, uh, which is that all good work is done in spite of editors. You know, that you got to have a stubborn bone for a story, a, a decision in your mind that you are going to go for it. Um, and sort of basically drag your editors along because every minute you spend on this story is a minute you're not spending on a story they find um, useful, compelling, more important. Can you tell everybody listening today a little bit about your road there? I, I don't want to color the colors in. I want to hear your version of this. I'm glad you asked me about that because, you know, I, I describe in the book um, sort of the push and pull that I've had, had with my editor, Casey Frank, who I adore, and we, he's been my editor for the, almost the entire time I've been at the Herald, which is 15 years. And, you know, I, I think anybody in journalism understands that, you know, part of the relationship between an editor and a reporter is you clash a lot because that's, I think, what makes uh, you're both passionate about things and you really want the best story possible. And, you know, there is some of that um, push and pull. And, and as you said, you know, at this time I was doing a, a very successful series on Florida prisons that had won a lot of awards and uh, he was very passionate about it. And, um, you know, it, he was, he's just a great editor. And, but I was thinking I want to do something else, you know, there's more stories to tell. So there was a little bit of a, uh, he wanted me to do prisons. I wanted to do Epstein. Um, and I sort of, you know, I did, you know, with my work sort of kept shoving it in front of him and saying, here, look at this, here, look at this. And, and one of the great things about Casey is he did look at it and eventually he realized what a good story this was. But, you know, editors' attentions are divided, especially at a regional and, and local newspapers where you just don't have the resources that you do at another paper to devote. So you sometimes, you know, they have to make tough decisions and uh, reporters don't always agree with their decisions. And I think um, to uh, Casey's credit, you know, after, you know, you know, all our back and forth and some, you know, some clashes that we had, uh, you know, he, he did come along and he did say, look, this really is a good story. And that's just part of, you know, journalism is very messy. You know, not all of it is, is, is pretty and not all, all of it is successful. In fact, <laughs> there are more failures sometimes than there are successes. And um, I, th I thought it was good to put a little bit of that in the book because I don't think as journalists we talk enough about that part of the story. And, it, and I think the public sometimes should, should know that this, it, it, it is a tough job for so many different reasons. And, and we're not in it for fame or, you know, I certainly never thought this would, um, you know, this would happened, you know, that it would be this big of a story, uh, you know, in fact, the night before that it ha happened or the morning, I was just praying that it would la land on the internet for maybe one day before it was forgotten. I never thought, you know, <laughs> it would explode. Yeah, no, I actually, I actually, we are going to get to that because I want to ask you a little bit more detail on that front. Um, I love that you talked about the messiness of reporting, right? Because all movies that capture what we do make it sound like, 
you know, somebody handed you a document and then you rush to publish that night and they stopped the presses and, and you, you zipped and you broke open this incredible bombshell. But no, it's not like that. So I want to talk to you a little bit and share with the, the viewers at WAPO Live sort of the the biggest high for you of this story along the reporting and research road and then the biggest low you know there are hard moments and mistakes and yeah. and long turns when you went down a rabbit hole for a month and it turned out it it delivered nothing so tell me if you could a little bit about the biggest high and the and the lowest low well, the biggest high definitely was being able to work with these victims. The, I always say that the real heroes of the story were the poor women that uh, confided in us. It took a lot of courage to talk about the worst part of your life with a complete stranger. And they were the centerpiece, really, of this whole of this whole story, this whole series. Uh, and they were, quite frankly, the reason why Jeffrey Epstein was, was rearrested, because Emily put together a just a brilliant um, set of documentaries that featured their their voices, uh, photographs of them when they were younger. Uh, they talked about um, you know how they were betrayed not only by Epstein and the people around him who helped him perpetuate this crime, but also by the prosecutors who were supposed to um, you know were supposed to protect them. Really, I mean, even in the middle of all this. Uh, they were being intimidated by Epstein and his and his attorneys and his, his private investigators he hired, and the prosecutors didn't seem to even do anything about that. Uh, you know, in some what about, sense, they were. They what were, about? Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. What about the pressure you could have you faced from Epstein's lawyers and the power of the sort of wall of Epstein? Was did, what kind of experience did you have with his? his awesome force. Well, you know, the curious thing about this is when I was working on this, uh, you know, it wasn't until after I really was pretty deep into it that I thought I'd better reach out to Epstein and his lawyers. And I heard nothing, nothing back. I sent them emails, I sent them letters, I, I called them, nothing. And uh, so I just kept moving up forward and even right before uh, we published, I sent them, I sent out, you know, a whole long list of certified letters, return receipt to make sure. I think I heard uh, from Dershowitz, that's really the only person that I, a uh, lawyer that, that, you know, returned my, uh, my letter, you know, and, and called me. But I think that Epstein, I was sort of under the radar. I think that his his lawyers probably thought, oh, she's just a reporter for the little Miami uh, Herald. And I just don't think they knew what they were going to, what was going to hit them. You know, afterward, of course, things changed. Then I felt a lot of <laughs> people breathing down my neck. But uh, I was pretty fortunate in that they ignored me. They underestimated you at their peril. Um, so, you know, you just said something really revealing a minute ago, and I cut you off because I wanted to ask you about this, but you said you kind of hoped maybe it would be on the internet for one day. Well, it was like a, definitely a crashing symbol in our office. Uh, I remember it well. Um, what did you think the immediate fallout of this was? Actually, forgive me, I, I, I want to make sure I get this question in. July 2019 is the fallout. Jeffrey Berman, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, the most powerful prosecutor in the land, um, announces after the FBI investigation that followed the publication of your work that they're going to charge him. Um, and the Columbia Journalism Review basically says this is what happens when a re reporter refuses to give up on a story. I know this sounds like a, you know, TV guide question, but how did you feel then? I was just in shock. I, you know, there's no other way to put it. I mean, that just doesn't happen, as you know. Um, <laughs> the prosecutor stands up at a press conference and says, uh, this is the result of some very um, good investigative journalism. They don't- Some, ex <laughs> some excellent <laughs> investigative journalism, he said. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I didn't, it was the last thing I, I expected. I. You know, that just doesn't happen. Um, prosecutors don't 
I don't know of any other time that I can think of, maybe you do, but I don't remember too often that a prosecutor credits a journalist with uh, with anything, really. So, you know, all I could say is I was pretty, I was pretty shocked. I mean, in my heart, I knew that my story had something to do with it, but I sort of thought, well, they got some kind of big bombshell new piece of something or another that led them to do this. And really, when you looked at the indictment, there really wasn't a whole lot uh, in there that was new. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure that they were working diligently at the time and, and uh, I'm sure they also would have gotten more victims, hopefully, uh, to come forward and make the case a little more solid. You know, what I'm struck by too, Julie, is thinking about how you paired up with uh, a visual journalist, a videographer. How did you get rolling in doing that? And tell me a little bit about how that partnership worked. I apologize, audience. I can't read your questions. I don't know why. Um, I'm looking at my screen, but I can't, so I've got to just do mine. Go ahead, Julie. Um, well, Emily and I had worked together on other projects before we had um, you know, we have the same kind of journalism um, sense and, and what we like to work on. We did the, uh, a big series on the women's prison in Florida, which is just a horrible, cruel uh, place to be uh, and remains really, really brutal. And we did uh, a series of uh, documentaries in connection with uh, that series that we did. And so when I started this, I said to Emily, you know, my goal would be to try to get these victims to talk. And I want you, you know, I'd like you to work on it with me from the very beginning. I mean, that that was key, ha having her work with me, because I'm not a visual journalist. Uh, she is. And so if you're with a visual journalist from the beginning, it, they help you figure out how to put the piece together visually. So I, I think that that was another part of the success uh, that we were able to do that from the get-go. Instead of doing the reporting, then going back and saying, this is what we need photographs of, this is what we need video of. I want to quickly, in the last few moments, um, go to the end of this story. A little bit, um, you know, a little bit of justice and a little bit of sadness for the victims about not really getting their day in court with Epstein. And that is, you know, his death in um, the MCC, the prison in New York. You and I uh, share um, some reporting instinct about this, and I, I wrote a little bit about it too, So, with suspicion about concluding that we know what happened. Tell me what you think happened in that jail. What do you think um, caused his death? Well, you know, I, I labeled a chapter that, you know, saying Jeffrey Epstein didn't commit suicide, which was really kind of a joke on the conspiracy theory that's been circulating around there. Um, not that I definitively was trying to say I have evidence that he didn't do it. But, you know, when people ask me, I say I really seriously doubt that he that he did commit suicide, at least without assistance, because, uh, as you know, uh, you know, this was a man who uh, <laughs> if he if he did commit suicide the way authorities say he did, he would have had to be pretty strong to break three bones in his body, to do this while uh, tied to the top bunk, a bunk that had toiletries on it that were undisturbed, um, in a cell where there were wires on the floor from a sleep apnea machine, um, and, you know, things there that you, sh you wouldn't have in a cell with a man that, you know, he had been on suicide watch prior to this time. And, you know, his cellmate was removed. You just didn't have one corrections officer fall asleep or be distracted. You had two, which from covering prisons, that's really highly unusual that you have two guards, you know, and it, it's just too crazy. I mean, there's just too many, and, and you know, things that don't make sense. Number one and number two, authorities haven't seen fit to release any of these so-called investigations that they called. Uh, the DOJ's investigation is still open. Um, I mean, there's just too many things. Once again, it's sort of the theme of the story that there's uh, documents that are sealed. There are documents that are redacted. There are reports that aren't released. Uh, the Herald has spent, you know, I don't even want to know how many thousands and thousands of dollars trying to unseal documents in some of these cases. Uh, so, you know, as long as you have this kind of secrecy in our criminal justice system, I think that it, it hides the truth and it also prevents people from coming forward and, um, you know, and helping with their cases because 
uh, their suspicion. Why are, um, you know, why are authorities, uh, what are they trying to hide? Julie, this was such a pleasure. I know you're off to um, another blockbuster story, no doubt. You're not going to, um, you've, you've nailed this one. Uh, let's see what you do next. I can't wait to see it. Um, thank you to the Washington Post Live audience. I know you've enjoyed this as much as I have. What a treat. Good luck to you in your work and good luck with your book, Perversion of Justice. It, it really, let's just look at it. It matches my dress too. I think you're going to really enjoy reading what a, a real journalist has accomplished by just being stubborn and sticking with it. Well done.